David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. Paul preached that all is lost, save no Little John said he is precious by leaning on his bosom so for a moment may I humbly testify did I We are glad to have Brother Daniel Freed. I've never met Brother Freed till last night, and uh, I have heard of the ministry there and know folk that uh, are acquainted with their ministry, and we thank God for it. We love the Jews, and we know the promise of God in his word as far as our attitude and heart toward the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. 
And uh, I was telling Brother Freed last night, the rabbi that Cindy and I had lunch with on Monday, uh, he was commenting about, and I heard on the news this week that uh, last year the Jews returned to Israel at a greater rate than ever. And uh, I told that rabbi, I said, he was all excited about it. And I said, I'm just as excited as you are, but for a different reason. And uh, we know we know the promises of God in his word regarding that. But I uh, enjoyed uh, speaking with Brother Freed last night. And Brother Freed, you come and give to us what the Lord's put on your heart. And uh, you got a bottle, somebody give you a bottle. You got a cup of water over here. I just ask you don't preach long enough if you need both of <laughs> So just go yeah. ahead. Do, Thank you, brother. God bless. Appreciate you so much, dear brother. All right, sounds good. All right, so good to be here uh, today. I count it a, a, a rich blessing indeed uh, to be here. Uh, no greater place to be this side of heaven than to be in the house of the living God, especially when you consider that uh, 17 years of my unconverted life, I went to a synagogue, and when I went to a synagogue, I had already uh, been depressed and discouraged about life, and uh, you know, in the synagogue, you may not know this, but they usually play in the minor key, and they're always talking about the Holocaust, and uh, it's always sad, and there's no hope, and there's really no joy, they don't have, they don't have the joy of the Lord, and by the time I left the synagogue, I'm telling you, I was suicidal, <laughs> and, um, but it ought never to be that way in the house of the living God. Amen. And you know, the blessing of being in this, uh, uh, this church here and this uh, building here is uh, quite different than the way the Jews uh, used to worship back in the Bible days. You know, back in the Bible days, especially during uh, the temples, uh, they would have a place for the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles, and then they would have a place where uh, they would uh, blow the shofar, the trumpets, you know, and they would make a, a, lot of, a lot of noise. And then, of course, they had a place they, where they just uh, were very quiet and solemn and reverential, and they were just worshiping the Lord. And so uh, they had a place for the ladies, and then they had a place for the men, and, um, but aren't you glad that today we can do it all in one place? That's a blessing, isn't it? Now, don't get, don't get nervous now if I get a little excited, because uh, I do get a little excited. Amen. Because I'm a saved Jew. Now, Jews are already emotional creatures, you know. But when they get born again, you better watch out. And so, uh, I, I like it. I like it. And, you know, God, God's... Uh, I tell people God's in the shouting business. You know, the Bible says that he inhabiteth the praises of his people. And so he likes it, and he likes it loud. And, and we're going to be praising God uh, all the way uh, uh, as we get the rapture. Do you believe in the rapture? Amen. Yes, I'll tell you what I believe in the taking up. And, uh, and we're going to be taken up sooner than you, than you know. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I really count a great privilege to be here. I'm preacher. You, you're such a, uh, you have such an excellent spirit, and you love God, and, and uh, you have a wonderful church. As uh, some of the Yiddish mamas would say, you have a wonderful church. <laughs> and uh, and the, the thing I noticed right off the bat about your church here, they all know how to smile. <laughs> Isn't that good? You are not to come to the house of God with poochy lips now. Come on now. Come on. That's right. And uh, th this, is the, this is the time we get together and, uh, and uh, we get to fellowship and rejoice together. And I don't know about you, but I got something to shout about. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you, if you knew you had eternity to look forward to, you had something to shout about. And you say, well, I'm not used to shouting. Well, you'll get used to it. When you hear that trumpet sound, Amen. I got a proof text on that, that Psalms 47 verse 5, and it talks about the blowing of the trumpet, and then the Bible says uh, that the Lord went up with a shout, Amen. and if, you're, if you are uh, saved and you got the Holy Ghost in you, you're, you are uh, indwelled of the Holy Ghost, right, and that means the Lord's going to go up with the shout, and you'll be shouting all the way to glory. And this is just on-the-job training. 
And some of you say, well, I'm not used to shouting now, Brother Free. Well, you, you know how to shout at your wife. Come on now. <laughs> Leave me alone. Yeah. I, I need to tell you this before I get. I'm not here for a marriage seminar, but I got to tell you this. Uh, wh wh whenever your wife yells at you, now, if she don't yell at you at least one time in your marriage, I've been married, how long have I been married, honey? <laughs> Anyway, hey, sweetheart, would you, would you stand? There's my lovely wife, Rebecca. There she is, just as beautiful as when I first met her. And then my, my daughter, Naomi, if you'd stand, okay? <laughs> all right. Now, the reason why my wife is still so beautiful after all the how long we've been married, honey? 45 years or something like that? Close to it, right, yeah. Is my wife eats a lot of tomatoes. So if you ladies want to keep beautiful, eat those tomatoes, all right? I'm serious. I'm not joking now. I'm serious. There's something in those tomatoes. And uh, anyhow, uh, when your wife gets upset at you, and she's going to do that because, you know, we husbands, we don't think about our wives like we should, right, sometimes. Take them for granted. Come on, you ladies ought to shout on that one. Come on now. And the best thing to do is hop in your car. And I mean, I mean, you get in your car and you rush to Walmart. <laughs> you get there as quick as possible and you buy a, a $100 gift certificate. Come on, ladies, give me an amen on that one. Get the biggest bowl of flowers, bouquet of flowers, and, and then rush back and give it to her. Give her a nice uh, bear hug and say, I love you, sweetheart. <laughs> amen. Everything will be just fine. That's how you have a happy marriage. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to help you out a little bit. And, uh, well, you know, they say to me, how can you tell the difference between a full-blooded Jew and a full-blooded Gentile? Well, uh, it all depends on how big their nose is. <laughs> Seriously. Have you ever noticed? I don't know, did that fella have a big nose, brother? Uh, <laughs> Are you trying to, okay, right. <laughs> well, they usually do. Uh, they usually do, not all the time. Uh, and um, so I want to prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am a full-blooded Jew, just in case you think I'm not a Jew, but I am a Jew. Look at that nose that God blessed me with. Isn't that a blessing of God? And seriously, my dad had such a long nose, he had to get a nose job. It was so it was so. So big and everything. So anyway, um, uh, God is too wise to make a mistake, and he put the big nose on the Jews to remind them that God's in the smelling business, seriously speaking. And now the Jews have a, a saying that they, they follow the God of the long nose. That's right. Almost sounds like some American Indian would say. They follow the God of the long nose. Well, Believe it or not, in your King James Bible, several times you read the word long-suffering or you read uh, slow to, to anger, slow to wrath. And believe it or not, those words come uh, from a word that means long nose. <laughs> so let me give you the analogy here. I guarantee you, if you look in the mirror, if, you've been, uh, if you're over 50 years old and you look in the mirror, you'll notice something about your face. All right? No, don't worry, I, the mirrors won't crack, okay? But you will notice your nose is bigger than it was 20 years ago. Guarantee it. Guarantee it. And your nose actually grows. As you get older, your nose gets bigger. So the idea is the older you get, the longer your nose gets, and the more long-suffering you ought to be. Uh -huh. That's right. So when, you're, when you get angry, then you got a short nose, <laughs> And if you have a lot of patience and long suffering and forbearance, you got a long nose. All right? So when your husband starts getting upset at you, you said, Oh, stop now, you got a short nose. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to help you out a little bit. All right, just try to give you a little some some of that Jewish uh, wisdom. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, 
if you would please, uh, uh, please come tonight. I, I would tell you, if everybody here this morning can come tonight, you'll bless this, this Jew right here. I'm serious. I would really hope every one of me, I don't, I don't think you want to miss tonight. Uh, tonight's going to be special. And I, I really would be blessed beyond measure. And then the Bible says to give none offense to the Jew. So you offend me if you could be here tonight and you don't show up, all right? How many will do God give him best to be here tonight? All right, I appreciate that very much. Okay, so let's all stand if you can, if you're able to stand. And if you have a good old Holy Ghost authorized Bible, you all know what that is, right? And, uh, and if you don't have a Bible, just listen. And I'd like you all turn, if you would please, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. All right. The Bible says there in verse 1, Brethren, so he's talking to say people here, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I read that one more time. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, Heavenly Father, with these words, we thank you so much for the blessing of knowing Christ as our Lord and Savior and those of us that are truly saved. I rejoice now, Father, that you are able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. And I pray now that you will do a work in the hearts of thy people. And I pray, O oh God, uh, that you'll bless this wonderful church. They love the Jew, it's so evident. That's a blessing to my heart, dear God. Please bless them for it. And uh, thank you and continue to use them for the furtherance of the gospel. And as already been stated, Father, there might be a lost sinner here among us on their way to a devil's hell. And whether there's their religion or their self-righteousness or their works for righteousness, whatever it is, but it's not uh, dependent upon the merit of our Savior who hung on an old rugged cross and shed his blood for their sins. They're trying to get to heaven their own way, and there's no other way, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now I pray, Father, you'll save that lost sinner, and you'll give them eternal life as you've promised, and write their names in the Lamb, Lamb's book of life forever, and we'll thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I appreciate the music. I appreciate the music, uh, and I appreciate uh, the good the Bible class this morning. It was I, I, I like it. How, how many were in Bible class this morning? I liked it, and uh, I appreciate the, the sweet spirit of um, of uh, the church and of the of the teacher there, and I appreciate it so very very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to tell you something. This verse, I, I don't know. I, I don't believe. There's any Calvinists here. Now, if you're a Calvinist, I do love you. Amen? But I'm not a Calvinist, and I don't believe I'm in a Calvinist church. Uh, usually, I don't ever get invited to a Calvinist church. And if I did, I wouldn't know it, and then I guarantee you I wouldn't be invited back. All right? Now, I don't hate the Calvinists. I don't hate them. I don't hate them at all. But I do believe that um, they're misguided. They're misguided in some things. You know, our brother mentioned Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Now, he started out as a hyper-Calvinist. By the time he got older, he realized that a lot of that stuff was just foolishness. And he, he actually said, I read this, he said, I'm having a hard time reconciling the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. The fact of the matter, he even admitted there was a free will of man was a big jump for him. And I want you to know that Paul was surely not a Calvinist. He, he, he was not a Calvinist because this prayer proves beyond a shadow of doubt he wasn't. He said, my heart's desire and prayer to God. See, that's in the, that's in the present, uh, uh, continual present tense. That, that means that it's not only good for then when he said that, but it's also good for today. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is. It is. And here's a mighty word that they might be saved. <laughs> isn't that amazing? I mean, isn't that amazing? That the Jews can get saved. 
That's amazing. And I was in a, I was in a missions conference. I've done many over the years. Uh, and there were a bunch of other uh, directors of missions, missions there and everything. And there was one very well-known missions director. He's not alive any longer. But he had the audacity to come to me and say, Dr. Freed, you are wasting your time reaching those Jews. <laughs> and, you know, he just didn't realize what God saved me from. So I'm thankful that I was saved. Amen? Amen. And when he said that, I will tell you, I don't know exactly how my response was, but I said something like this. Hey, what you talking about, sir? I am saved, amen. See, I'm saved. I got saved. I'm a Jew. <laughs> Boy, he got scared. <laughs> Don't come and say that Jews cannot get saved. No, Paul said they can be saved. The potential that Jews can be saved is so evident. We've seen more Jews come to know Christ in the last. We've been, a whole Israel Baptist mission has been added by the grace of God. We started 25 years ago, and we've seen more Jews open to the gospel than ever before since, since the time of New Testament era. You see, they are awakening to the reality that there's something more than what their false religion is offering them. I have rabbis on both sides of my family. My family doesn't know anything about the hope of Israel. My family knows nothing about the joy of the Spirit of God. My family has absolutely no concept at all of what it means to have a personal relationship with Christ. Now, they know all about religion, and they wrote the book on religion, but ladies and gentlemen, religion will only damn your soul. Religion is the most damnable thing in, the, in these days. Religion is essentially good works. Man's good works to merit the favor of God. It doesn't matter how you, how you, uh, uh, how you present it. But when a lost sinner tries to get saved by being good, they are actually and spiritually spitting in the face of Christ. Because there was none other who could be good enough to be worthy of paying for our sins. The just who died for the unjust. The righteous who died for the unrighteous. And he didn't come for the righteous, you know that. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And ladies and gentlemen, Judaism today is smacking in the face of the good grace of God and smacking in the face of their Messiah. Now, they are blinded. Uh, we know they're blinded, but it's only in part. And so Paul believed that the Jews could get saved, and that's why he prayed so. He, that was his sincere desire. That's my sincere desire. I believe that's your sincere desire. Otherwise, the preacher wouldn't have me here. And um, I wouldn't waste my time trying to reach my own people, if I didn't believe they could be saved. Why would you waste your time to, to talk to anybody if you thought they couldn't be saved? Uh, I, I believe everybody can be saved because I don't know, I don't know the ones that, that are turned over to a reprobate mind. I don't even worry about that. That's God's business. But I talk, I tell people the gospel as if they can be saved because Paul said so. And if they don't get saved, it's not going to be God's fault. Because God will do everything to save them. I believe that. I really believe that. But beloved, <clears throat> essentially there are three major problems or stumbling blocks that Jewish people have in particular. But I, I think in the last days, I think most people have these same problems. Three stumbling blocks. You wonder why hundreds of thousands are not getting saved in the United States. Now, Preacher and I talked about the Philippines. There are thousands getting saved in Sudan and Nigeria and uh, Ukraine and other places in the world. There are many are coming to know Christ. But in the United States of America, 
we are seeing a dearth. We're, we're seeing a famine of the Word of God, not because we don't have the Bible. Many of us have two, three Bibles. It's because people are not listening to the Word of God, and they're not, they're not being uh, evangelized. You know, for 17 years of my unconverted life, not one person gave me a gospel tract. Not one person told me who Jesus was, except when I was a little boy. I was playing with another boy. He was about four years old, and I was about four, three, four. And for some odd reason, I, he must have found out I was a Jew, and he asked me this, uh, this, this uh, question. He said, did you know Jesus was a Jew? <laughs> well, I was just trying to find out what being a Jew was. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't have a big nose yet. Now, one of my preacher friends tried to be funny with me. He said, I know why Jews got big noses, because the air is free. I'm sure you've heard that. Now, don't tell that to your friend there. I don't know why the Jewish people get such a bad rap when it comes to money. If anybody knows about money, they know about money. And they're not cheap. They're the most generous people in the world. They, they give more to humanitarian causes at any group of people in the world per capita. They're just smart with their money. They don't waste their money, right? And they invest their money. And by the way, God blessed them with the brains to do so. After all, it did say in Genesis 12 that the seed of Abraham, the Jews, would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And you're sitting right here because of that. How many of you have a good old-fashioned King James Bible? Let, lift it up if you don't mind. Now, so, some of you husbands need some practice. Go ahead and give a kiss. Come on, you all can kiss your Bible. It wouldn't hurt you a bit. Mm, praise God. The Bible says that it was committed unto them, the Jews, referring to the Jews, the oracles of God. Amen. If it wasn't for the Jewish people, we wouldn't have the scriptures. I wonder how many could raise their hand this morning and said, I remember the day when the Lord saved me. Anybody? You'll never forget it. You'll never forget it, ladies and gentlemen, when God saved you. And yet the Bible does say, salvation is of the Jew. Mm -hmm. And when they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ and put him on an old rugged cross, Pilate wrote this inscription, he used a definite article, and he said, uh, so many words, then he said, the king of the Jews. One time I had a preacher come to me, and again, I don't know why he would say such a crazy thing. He said to me, this and that about the Jews, and the Jews are this, and the Jews are that. And I told him, I said, sir, I don't even believe you're saved. I think you're a lost man. I think you're a harling. I, I think that you're just wearing the cloak of Christianity. And of course, he was blushing and he was very uh, he was very embarrassed, and I offended him. But that's okay to offend in that case. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And he said, "Why? Why would you say such a thing like that?" I said, "Well, if you, if you only understood that Jesus was a Jew, he hung on a old rugged cross." He was a Jew, and your Savior is a Jew, and look how you feel about the Jews. You don't like the Jews, so you don't like Jesus. That means you're not saved. I don't know about you, but that song that was just sung, I don't know about you, but I love Jesus. And I love him with all my heart, soul, and might. I do. How many do? And it, maybe we lack sometimes, but I sure want to. And because I love him, with all my heart, soul, and might, I love God's chosen people. It don't matter what they've done. I love them anyway. Seems like God understood that. They failed him, disobeyed him, did some horrible things, yet God over and over and over again forgave him, loved him, and he still loves him. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. So, so the Bible says right there in verse 2, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And they are very zealous. I mean, they, 
uh, the ones that go to yeshiva school and religious school and everything like that, they, they could quote to you. See, the way it normally works among the Orthodox, for so the first five years of their upbringing, they're taught the scriptures. They're taught to memorize uh, the, the first five books of Moses. But by the time they're about five years old, uh, they now are being taught what rabbi so-and-so said about what rabbi so-and-so said. So by the time they're in their 20s, they have memorized thousands of sayings about what the rabbinical sages have taught, and they don't even remember what the Bible says. And that's why Jesus says you do err, not knowing the scriptures. And so they are very zealous, the Jewish people. And uh, I, I'm sure many of you wouldn't even be alive today if it wasn't for the Jewish people because of their zeal that God has used to bless. Like, for example, how many of you taken an aspirin this week? Anybody taken aspirin this week? Has anyone ever gotten a, uh, anabol uh, a, um, a shot of, um, of uh, um, penicillin? That's what I'm trying to think of. Penicillin. Amen. Uh, and on and on I could go. Do we have a, a, a railroad crossing around here? Is there a, a railroad? Have you ever stopped at a railroad crossing when it goes down like this? Have you ever bowed your head and said, Lord, thank you for the Jew that invented the railroad crossing? Huh? Ever done that? You know, our kids would be walking around for the most part with polio if it wasn't for that Jew who invented the polio vaccine. Amen? Did they have, listen, the, they have... Over 30% of the Nobel Prizes have been awarded to Jewish people, and they only make up 0.02% of the world's population. The Jewish people have been blessed by God to be a blessing to all the families of earth, but especially because they gave us our Savior. We're debtors. There is no amount of money, no amount of help, no amount of blessing, no amount of anything that we could ever do to repay the debt that even I owe to the Jewish people. But we can do everything we can to give them the gospel. That's what we can do. And I, <clears throat> But those three stumbling blocks, I, I want to just uh, show you here. Verse 3. Let, let's look at the first one right away. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Listen, when I grew up, I could never do anything wrong. I mean, it wouldn't matter what I did. My mom would turn it around and, and somehow make me feel good about what I did or after what I did, and I got seemingly right about it. Uh, one, one day, if I came home and my, uh, my clothes was uh, all bloodied and everything like that, and my mom would, would get hysterical and say, what, 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 what happened? What, what did you do this time? And I said, well, Mom, I just, just beat this, this guy up and because he called me a dirty Jew. Oh, my mom would get all upset about it. She said, son, you, your two wrongs don't make a right. You, you, you need to go back and see, uh, and get, get that right. You know, get that right with that boy. I said, oh, I will, mom, if he's alive. <laughs> I told you I was, I, was, I was pretty wicked. I was a wicked devil. I didn't know I was wicked, but I, but I was. I didn't even know I was a sinner until I started reading the King James Bible. And so my mom, I come back and say, you know, mom, um, <clears throat> I, I, he's okay, and and I made, uh, you know, I made things right with him. And um, my mom, my mom would pat me on the head. He's such a good boy. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Such a good boy. And she'd give me this little sermonette and say, you know, we all make mistakes, son. And she said, you'll get over it. It wouldn't matter what I did. If I killed somebody, whatever, somehow my mom would turn around. It's just a mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't a mistake. If you kill someone, if you lie, right? Commit adultery, right? Fornicate, right? Curse, on and on you go. Break any one of the Ten Commandments. The Bible says you're guilty of all of them. It's not a mistake. It's a sin against a holy God. And that sin will send you to a devil's hell. And how many sins does it take to be a sinner? One. You've heard this many times, I'm sure. The wages of sin is death. Now that's bad enough. But the worst of it is death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire. 
So the Jewish people are ignorant of God's righteousness, and that's why they're guilty of the second stumbling block. They're going about to establish their own righteousness, and that's what I was talking about, that their religion is their substitute for salvation and ain't going to save them. It's only going to make it worse. It doesn't matter what religion you are. We, we heard about the Hindus or the Buddhists or, or any, any other religion. It might just not even be a religion. It might be a religious attitude, an a attitude of I'm a pretty good person. And if you're, what do you mean you're a pretty good person? That's why I tell parents, be very careful. Don't do what my mama did to me. Don't be telling your boys, your, your, your sons and the daughters, you're such a good boy. You're such a good girl. Don't do that. Don't do that. You, you're helping them become self-righteous. They are no good, dirty, low-down, depraved sinners. Your little baby boy. Come on now. They were born sinners, were they not? The only time they ever become good is when the one who is good possesses them. Then you could say uh, that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. But until then, they are vile and they stink in the nostrils of God. I know people don't like hearing it, but you want me to lie to you? You want me to tell you the truth? So, number one, stumbling block, they're ignorant of God's righteousness. I never knew I was a sinner. I thought I was a good boy. <laughs> and number two, I, I, I endeavored to follow Judaism the best I could, but that was just damning my soul twice. Here's the worst of it. No country in the world has sent out more missionaries, has preached more gospel, has had seen more revivals than the United States of America. You mark it down. I've studied a lot on revival. This country is a beacon of light to all the nations. And the worst of it all is we have plenty of preachers. We have plenty of Baptist churches. In my county alone, there's over 100 Baptist churches. I know different flavors, but still Baptist, Baptist, right? And I'm just trying to tell you, there's churches everywhere. You probably got lots of churches out here. But now look at it. How many are really preaching the unadulterated word of God? How many even use the King James Bible anymore? See? But what's happening is we got the truth. We got loads of truth. But now America is refusing to submit herself to the righteousness of God. Yeah. Now let me close with this. I know where I was at 9-11. How many know where that you were at 9-11? It was 9-11, it, it was a shocker. I was at an old-fashioned preacher's meeting in uh, Oceana, West Virginia. When I got there, it was late. And everybody looked like they were well, they had come to a funeral and they were sad and, and I couldn't understand what was going on. And I sat up here in the front pew and, and uh, they, 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 finally the preacher next to me said, uh, I asked him, I said, what's happening? We lost a man of God or what, what's going on? He said, haven't you heard? No, I didn't hear. And you know the story, 9-11, it was terrible, right? Terrible, terrible thing. And about for 30 days, man, America was on fire for God. I mean, they, I mean your church may have doubled, I don't know. I mean, people were starting to think about God, right? And, and everything seemed like we could have revival once again in America. 30 days gone, went right back to our old ways. Refused to submit ourselves to the righteousness of God because we have our own religion. You know what that is? The, the religion of, uh, of, of self-righteousness. So, when I was 17 years old, I joined the military, believe it or not. I, I lived in Israel. 
And then I came back, and uh, it's a long story. <clears throat> I came back, and uh, I wasn't, was my, my dad had to sign me in because I was 17. And when I came back, I was, I was in bad shape. I really was in bad shape. And my uncle and my grandfather died within a month of each other. My uncle was a famous rabbi in New York City. And um, I went to his library searching for the truth because I could not find any happiness in any other. I couldn't find happiness. I couldn't find the peace of God in Judaism. I didn't have the joy of God. I didn't even know what it meant to be saved. I, I didn't know any of that. And, and while I'm searching for the truth among all these books he had, I was about ready to give up. And I'll tell you what, this will make a Presbyterian shout. Let me tell you what happened. Now, I'm not a Calvinist, but I do believe in the sovereignty of God. Amen. Somehow or another, God worked this out for me, a lost Jew. And I went to the most sacred part of my uncle's library. There it was. He had very, very, uh, uh, he had books that were worth thousands of dollars. They're in museums all around the world. And there was a little black book about the size of this wedged in the middle of these large books written by hand over 300 years old. And curiosity killed the cat, I was the cat. And I, and I, and I went to and I got that little black book out and, and guess what it said? I remember it saying holy scriptures and went to my auntie and I said, can I have that? She was so happy, she was about ready to cry. She said, would, would to God in so many words, would to God you become a rabbi like Uncle Shep. <laughs> and so I brought it home with me you won't believe this, but when I opened up the pages, I started reading the first five books of Moses. Then I read some more books, which the Jews call the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament. And then I found more books I never even heard about. Uncle Shep never told me about the Gospel of Matthew. Amen. Amen. Hey, he never told me about the Gospel of Mark and Luke and John. Amen. He never told me about any of that. Somebody had given my uncle one of the chief rabbis in New York City, a King James Bible. About 60 years before I discovered it. What do you think about that? And as I started reading it, God showed me some things I never knew about myself. All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. And I had gone astray. And I was a lost sinner on my way to a devil's hell. And I started reading that New Testament, find out that the Jesus of the New Testament was the Messiah of that Old Testament. And God put me on the Holy Ghost conviction. And man, I didn't have to work to get saved. I begged God to save me, amen? I said, I'm, a, I'm an unworthy sinner. I'm wicked. I deserved, I deserve hell. I deserve the wrath of God. And I, I pretty much begged him to save me because I knew I wasn't worthy of his favor, Amen. When I asked the Lord, as many as received him to them, gave me power, become the sons of God, even unto them that believe on his name. And guess what happened to me? I got saved. I got saved. I got born again. And my name was written in the Lamb's book of life, and it's still there. Heavenly Father, I pray now as preacher comes, there might be a religionist person here, men, woman, that is depending on their self-righteousness or the good works of the religion to get saved or to go through the pearly gates one day. I pray you'll save that lost sinner in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother.